All right, so it's good to see everybody today. Thank you for your understanding as my schedule changes uh, uh, at the last minute. Uh, last week I was in New York as my daughter and son-in-law had their baby and we had the bris this past Tuesday. <clears throat> His name is Eyal Rubin. Uh, named for my father-in-law Ephraim, so you got the E for Eyal uh, for that, and my son-in-law's aunt Robin becomes Reuben. So anyway, enough about me. Uh, it's good to see everybody. And it said that it was a good thing, a happy event. Yes, yes. Yes. Thank you. As opposed to Talmud class this Sunday, which has to be canceled because of a funeral uh, that I have to do. So. Yeah, so it goes. Baruch Atadonai Eloheinu Melech Olam, Sherkit Shana B'mitzvotav et Sivanu La'asok B'divrei Torah. So <clears throat> I have a note that we finished chapter two last time in, in the book with the commentary, but we didn't read from ancient Israel. <clears throat> so if we turn to ancient Israel, <clears throat> to page, uh, excuse me, to page 116. We'll read the, the commentary there uh, on chapter two. So um, remember that chapter two was about this angel of God speaking to the people of Israel, which was unusual in that usually uh, a prophet is the one who's going to speak to the people. Well, at least in the timeline of the Bible to this point, it's Joshua and before him Moses, who spoke to the people on behalf of God. Joshua is dead. Now there's an angel speaking. So as I pointed out last time, this is unusual for the Bible because uh, either it's God on Mount Sinai, who the people heard directly, or Moses and, and uh, Joshua, but not uh, some angel speaking to them. So, and, and it's just about the chapter two is just a reminder to the people to uphold the covenant. Okay, so below the line on 116, Bochim, the name which means weepers, is proleptic, and its origin will explain, will be explained in verses five to six. I have taken you up from Egypt. The Lord's messenger is not speaking in his own person, but is serving as God's mouthpiece, quoting his words. I said, this verb in Hebrew can also mean I thought, perhaps an ellipsis for I said in my heart. And it's not clear whether God actually addresses these words to Israel or merely, merely thinks them. The same ambiguity hovers over I also said in verse 3. So I think Alter is just reflecting the idea of the, uh, how do we understand the angel talking? Is it, is, is the book of Judges, and by extension we can ask, is the Bible an actual record of God and the prophets speaking to the people? Or is it a perspective of the author of the story or the editors of the story is it their perspective on what they think god must have been saying okay so uh, that i think perhaps um altar is reflecting there um two their altars you shall smash this is in keeping with the vehement anti-pagan agenda of deuteronomy Thorns, the Hebrew tzidim, would appear to mean sides. A common expression in contexts like this one is thorns, which are sinim in your sides. This might be an ellipsis here, or more likely, the similarity of the two words might have led a scribe to inadvertently replace sinim with tzidim. Uh, 117, and Joshua sent off the people. The appearance of Joshua makes it clear that this entire passage loops back chronologically 
to the end of the book of Joshua when Joshua addresses the people, perhaps not long before his death. And the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua. This entire verse repeats verbatim Joshua 24, 31, with the exception of the people, which in Joshua is Israel. The great acts, the Hebrew uses a singular noun with collective force. The same usage occurs in ver verse 10. They serve the Baalim. This is the plural form of Baal, the Canaanite weather god, and probably the most widely worshipped deity in the Canaanite pantheon. Many interpreters infer that the plural form indicates Baal and other pagan gods. Baal and Ashtorot, here Baal is singular, and Ashtorot shows a feminine plural ending. The singular in this traditional transliteration would be Ashtoret. Ashtoret is the Canaanite fertility goddess, though in some Ugaritic texts, Ugaritic is an ancient Semitic language, a precursor to Hebrew. So there's Ugaritic and Akkadian that are two ancient Semitic languages. So, um, though in some Ugaritic texts, she appears also as a warrior goddess. The plural form, as with Baalim in verse 11, may suggest that a variety of pagan goddesses is meant. 118, whenever they sallied forth, the Lord's hand was against them for harm. This whole passage articulates a clear-cut theological explanation for Israel's failure to conquer the entire land. It swerve into idolatry and rages God and causes him to bring about Israel's defeat by its enemies. Judges, the Hebrew verbal noun shofet means both one who judges and one who rules, and the latter sense is more prominent here and in all that follows in this book. As a result, some modern translations opt for chieftain or an equivalent term. The Shofet was an ad hoc military leader, in this regard chieftain, suggesting a fixed and perhaps hereditary political institution is misleading. From the subsequent narratives in this book, the judge was seen by his followers, or at any rate by the writer, as a figure suddenly invested with a divine spirit that impelled him to action and enabled his excess. It is precisely on the model of the biblical judges that Max Weber borrowed the term charisma from the Greek to indicate a purely personal political power. So just uh, again, the two uh, for here alters is highlighting the unusual use of the word show fate in the book of Judges that um, highlights a, a higher or a, a more uh, unusual um, role then in, in the book of Deuteronomy, we have a Torah portion called Shoftim, which is the, the role of, of legal judges to judge cases. So that's usually how the word Shofet is used as someone who sits on a bench um, deciding cases between a plaintiff and a defendant. So, but here in the book of Judges, it's not that kind of judge. That, that judge could, could handle cases that come before him or her, but mostly it's someone who is imbued with, some, with God's spirit. Okay, 18. The Lord was with the judge and rescued them from the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge. A theological reason is offered here for a continuing unstable military situation. The judges were basically guerrilla commanders, a judge exercising personal magnetism and military prowess could for a certain amount of time harass and drive back enemy forces that were probably superior in numbers and weaponry, but such successes were bound to be temporary. This fluctuating pattern is explained in terms of cultic loyalty and backsliding under the charismatic influence of the judge. The Israelites were faithful to their God. When the judge died, they reverted to their pagan practices. Verse 17 suggests that they did not heed their judges or only temporarily. 119, 
their actions. This imp the implication in context is evil actions, though the Hebrew noun used is not intris intrinsically negative. The nations that Joshua left when he died in order to test Israel through them. Here, a new theological explanation of the incompleteness of the conquest is introduced. Joshua, given his sweeping military successes, reported in Joshua 1 to 12, might well have conquered the entire land, but he left some of it in Canaanite hands in order to see whether future generations of Israel would be faithful to their God and thus be worthy of taking hold of the rest of the land. God's words in these two verses affirm that the people has failed the test and so will not be able to complete the conquest. The next verse then makes clear that Joshua's leaving part of the land unconquered was actually God's devising. So uh, again, we have a theological perspective of facts on the ground. So the facts on the ground are that Israel, is, the people of Israel are living in the land of Israel, but the land of Israel as envisioned in the Torah isn't entirely in Israel's hands. So why is that? So the book of Judges gives a theological perspective that, that it's intentional, that Joshua left it there uh, as part of God's plan as a test to see if the people are worthy of inheriting the, of possessing the entire land of Israel. And what the book of Judges and actually the rest of the Bible proves is that the people of Israel are not worthy. The people of Israel are backsliders. The people of Israel have rejected the covenant. And it's only at, at particular times and for short periods of time that the people are worthy. We'll see in the rest of the book the various judges who come along and under their leadership for a few years, the people believe in God and everything goes their way. But still, they haven't managed because of that to still conquer the entire land of Israel. And we'll see. Under King David, yes, there are times that the entire people are believing in God. But, and when King Solomon builds the temple, yeah, you have a few years that the people are really inspired and are believing in God. But the rest of the Bible then shows how the kings themselves, aside from the entire population, have neglected God. But again, from the theological perspective is that the, that the people, uh, because they neglected God, God is punishing them. So either by being harassed here in the book of Judges by the indigenous pagan population, or later in the Bible by the Assyrians, and then later the Babylonians coming in to conquer the land and send the people into exile. Right? So we have facts on the ground, uh, just what happens in the course of uh, a nation of Israel dealing with its enemies and dealing with domestic issues that for the Bible puts all of that into a religious perspective. Okay, so we could even apply the religious perspective today. And there are those in the Jewish community who would say that October 7th happened in Israel because of the lack of unity among the people of Israel, the lack of belief in God among the people of Israel, and then what kind of belief in God. So if it's the ultra-Orthodox, it's a ultra-Orthodox belief in God. So we have, so October 7th is a punishment for our wayward ways. And the extreme of that is the Holocaust is a punishment for the secular life that Jews in Germany led. Okay, so it's, it's for me, that, that is a blasphemous way of understanding God's, our relationship to God, but in the context of the Bible, it's the natural extension of understanding that. Okay, so for me, and for many other moderns, 
It's a problem. This theology is presented in the book of Judges and throughout the Bible presents a problem. Is this the kind of God we want to believe in? A God who is angry, a God who is vengeful, a God who is that active, so active in our lives. So here it's the live life of the nation, but we, by extension, on, in our personal lives, do we want to believe in a God who will bless us if we show reverence and bless us with good fortune or happy family occasions? And on the other hand, if we're not fully believing in God, do we want to believe in a God who will punish us with disease, with uh, uh, tragedy, crisis, things like that, right? So that, that is the age-old dilemma that uh, Jewish religious leaders have tried to uh, make sense of. Right and yes, Barbara. Yeah. How does this all go into the fact that going back to Noah, when God said that He was not going to do this again, interfere? Right. Well, so there in Noah, it's God's not going to bring a devastating flood again. It doesn't mean that God won't interfere. It just means that God won't interfere. So. Uh, globally right so the the uh, the, uh, the portion of noah presents the flood as if it's a uh, the entire earth was covered by this flood right so we know that lots of societies ancient societies have as part of their origin myth some kind of flood story so that throughout the world there are different people who have such a flood story. So that perhaps the, the flood was really um, particular to a, a, a place, not the entire world. But theologically, what the Torah is presenting is complete and utter devastation won't be caused by God. But we see after Noah that uh, God destroyed the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah Right, so that wasn't total devastation of the entire world, and God brought the ten plagues in Egypt, so all of Egypt was subject to devastation, but it wasn't the entire world. Okay, so so that's how the rabbis understand God's promise with the rainbow, but again, it it goes as part of the theology of the Bible. We do good will be rewarded, we do bad, will be punished. It's as simple as that. And uh, it's as devastating as that. And even more so, the rabbis say, uh, and they add to how difficult it is to accept, the more righteous you are, if you are, if you suffer, it's because God loves you that you're suffering, right? So why do bad things happen to good people? As Harold Kushner said, because good people can handle it. Okay, so that makes it even worse in my mind, this kind of theology. Okay, so that's why moderns have had to come up with different kinds of theology because based on the idea, we don't want to believe in a God that is vengeful and angry. We want to believe in a God that is compassionate and loving. That's, that's what makes sense as a human being to believe in, okay? So it gives us the chutzpah to develop religious ideas on our own, as opposed to them being handed down to us from God to Moses and on Mount Sinai, okay? So that's the chutzpah. And in fact, the ultra traditional would say, that's the blasphemy of modern theology is that we're going against the tradition which says that we we can't argue the Torah is the Torah because God gave it to Moses at Mount Sinai but that's because that's what the Torah says 
but who said it, <laughs> right? So we get to this, it's a catch-22 for moderns. It's not a catch-22 for traditionalist fundamentalists. Okay, all right, so let's, let's go on to, to chapter three. Uh, so in, in our edition, we're on page 175. Ve'ele ha'goyim asher hiniach Adonai lenasot bam et Yisrael et kol asher lo yad'u et kol milchamot kena'an. These are the nations which God left, that is, God left behind, to test, uh, through which they would test the people of Israel. It says to prove in the English, but prove in Old English means to test. Um, uh, even as, <coughs> even, so the, the, the Hebrew here is, is, um, is difficult. Et kol asher lo yadu, et kol milchamot kena'an. Even as many had not known all the wars of Canaan. Let's see how uh, alter trend. These are the nations that the Lord left aside to test Israel through them. All who knew not the wars of Canaan. Yeah, all who knew not the wars of Canaan. Okay. Uh, it's, it's just the for, the the the, uh, the Hebrew there is kind of unusual, but um, I think we have to keep on reading. Rak lemaan daat dorot b'nei Yisrael lelamda milchama rak asher lefanim lo yedaum. Only so that the generations of the people of Israel would know and to teach them war. Um, so just as those before him, before them did not know. In other words, these nations are left behind in order to teach future generations of Israel how to conduct war. Uh, okay, so it's just, um, we'll see the commentary in a little bit. Um, but let's keep going. Chameshet Sarnei Flishtim. The Chol Hakinani, the Hatsidoni, the Hachivi, Yoshev Har Halevanon, Mehar Baal Hermon, Ad Levo Hamat. So you have the five lords of the Philistines, and all of the Canaanites, and the Sidonians, and the Hivites, who dwell in the mountains of Lebanon from the Hermon or Baal Hermon until the entrance to Hamat. So this is in northern, so those are in northern Israel, but the Philistines are on the coast in southern Israel. Four, Vayihiyu lenasot bam et Yisrael ladaat hayishmu et mitzvot Adonai Asher tziva et avotam biyad Moshe. And they will be to test, through them to test Israel, to know if they would obey, uh, follow the commandments of God, who commanded their ancestors through the hand of Moses. Okay, so we have two reasons given for why these nations are left behind in Israel to teach the people how to conduct war and to test to see if um, the people are following God's commandments. Five, Uvene Yisrael, Yashvu Bekerev Hakinaani, Achiti, Vaha Emori, Vaha Prizi, Vaha Chivi, Vaha Yevusi. And the people of Israel dwelled among the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Vayikhu et binotehem lahem lenashim, viet binotehem natnu livnehem, viyavdu et elohehem. Now here's, here's the issue. And the daughters, no, the men, took 
their daughters, that is, the daughters of these, of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. So they took their daughters to them as wives. And, and Israel's daughters were given to their sons as wives, and they worshipped their gods. So there was intermarriage, and there was waywardness when it came to God. Okay, so society became assimilated and became uh, uh, followers of pagan religions, Canaanite religions, and not the followers of God. So let's look at the commentary on the first these first six sentences. Um, okay, bottom of 175. The first half of the verse continues the last verse of the previous chapter. Had not known. This alludes to the new generation in Israel, the older generation, which had experienced the impact of Canaanite warfare and the ensuing victories did not require proving or testing because they had demonstrated their faithfulness to God. All the wars of Canaan, the conquests achieved by Joshua and later by individual tribes. Two, the essential message of the verse is the need for future generations to know that in consequence of their sins, they would be compelled to learn the art of war. If they walked in the ways of God, this would be unnecessary. So that's interesting. There's a phrase that's that's repeated. Lo yisa goy al goy cherev lo yomadu od milchama. Nation will not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. So the purpose of learning more war is because the people of Israel have are backsliders and don't believe in God. <coughs> so the war. So in other words we might think that that phrase is talking about just living in peace. But it's really talking about, based on this idea from Judges, it's, it's more than just peace. Peace will come when we believe in God. Then we don't have to learn to fight anymore. Imagine then, right? So that, that goes to October 7th. If we only believed in God, then Hamas would not have attacked and we wouldn't have to um, uh, respond in self-defense. Okay, so again, un understanding the, diff the challenge of this kind of religious perspective. All right, so verse two, the commentary goes on, thereof, that is of the wars of the Canaanites and their tactics, hence the plural in the Hebrew. Five, namely, so what, who are the five lords of the Philistines? namely Gaza, Ashkelon, Ashdod, Gat, Ekron, and the surrounding territory. All right, so Gat and Ekron are archaeological places today. There is the city of Kiryat Gat that is built next to or on top of where Gat was, but Gaza, Ash Gaza clearly, Ashkelon and Ashdod are still there, and there are archaeological digs around Ashkelon, in Ashkelon and Ashdod from the Philistine times, uh, and the, the modern cities are built around them. Okay, uh, lords, uh, see on Joshua 13, the Hebrew word seren is used only of the Philistines and is probably a native term. Philistines, they formed a confederacy of the five cities. The difficulty of reconciling the statement that these territories were left unconquered with the statement in chapter 118 that at least three of these cities had been taken by Joshua. So there's that uh, textual problem. Leads Kimchi, medieval commentator, to conjecture that the Philistines had, Philistines had meanwhile regained what they had lost. The Philistines, after whom the Holy Land was called Palestine, arrived in Eretz Israel. This is just conjecture. We don't know how they arrived. In two waves, 
from Crete, the first at the time of the patriarchs when they settled in the southwest. At the time of the judges, a new wave arrived, overrunning the land and threatening to crush the Israelites. <coughs> we don't know this for sure. As far as I know, we still don't know where the Philistines came from. But that is the accepted idea that there's some Mediterranean people that sailed to the end of the Mediterranean, which is the Israel, the coast of Israel, and settled there. And because um, their culture is very different from Philistine, from Canaanite culture. And their language also is different. So that, that lends credence to the idea that they're outsiders, that they're, they're not a Semitic people. They come from the Mediterranean. Okay, Canaanites. Here are probably intended the inhabitants of the lowland from a, port, uh, from a point north of Philistia to a point just south of Zidon, which is in Lebanon. There's no, nece there's no necessity to suppose that the name included all the population west of the Jordan. <clears throat> Zidonians, see Joshua 13, there, there it is a collective term for the Phoenicians, as in Homer, uh, named after the metropolis Zidon. Later, the Philistines rebelled and established Tyre as the metropolis until it fell into the hands of Alexander of Macedon. Okay, so the Greeks knew about the Phoenicians because the Greeks extended their empire uh, to the edge of the Mediterranean and beyond into the Middle East. So they had encounters with uh, Philistines. Hivites, the Hebrew, the Hebrew pointing, that is the vowels, is Hivites, often mentioned in the Bible. At this time, they were in the central region of Canaan. Attempts have been made by modern scholars in light of recent archaeological discoveries to identify them with the Achaeans, and I have no idea who they are. Lebanon. This would complete the picture of encirclement provided by the list of unconquered places mentioned in this verse. So it almost uh, seemed then, from the way the commentary is presenting it, that Israel is landlocked. They might not have access at all to uh, the, the Mediterranean. Baal Hermon, according to Joshua 13, the boundary ran more precisely from Baal God under Mount Hermon unto the entrance of Hamat. Baal God was the northern limit of Joshua's conquests and was situated in the Lebanon Valley, hence probably on the western side of Mount Hermon, variantly identified as the modern Hasbeya or as Baal Bech. The entrance of Hamat, see on Joshua 12. Four, this verse explains the nature of the test mentioned in verse one. It clears up any ambiguity that may have arisen out of the statement in verse two. So in other words, it's more about testing Israel's loyalty to the commandments than they're testing their knowledge of war. <clears throat> to know, not that God should know, but that it might be proved to the Israelites. The same theological problem arose in the proving of Abraham, right? So Abraham was tested in Genesis, <clears throat> in Genesis 22. Here, the nations are mentioned in whose midst the Israelites dwelt. In verse three are listed the peoples on the frontiers. Canaanites, six nations are enumerated as often elsewhere. The total of seven includes the Girgashites. <clears throat> Hittites, see on <clears throat> chapter 1, Amorites, see of chapter 1, the Israelites ignored the warning of Moses, Deuteronomy 7, and intermarried with the natives, the consequence being the adoption of their seductive cults. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so now, starting with verse 7, the commentary says, this section recounts the 13 judges who governed the people and demonstrates the truth of the thesis stating, stated in chapter 2, 11 to 22. That is, that the people neglected to follow in God's ways, except for when judges came. 
Okay, so now we are going to be introduced to the first judge. Seven. Vayasu b'nei Yisrael et hara b'nei Adonai vayishkechu et Adonai Eloheihem vayavdu et ha'be'alim v'et ha'asherot. And the people of Israel did evil in the eyes of God, and they forgot, so they intentionally forgot God and their God, and they worshipped the Baalim and the Asherot. Eight, Vayichar af Adonai bi Yisrael, Vayim kareim biyad kushan rishataim, melech aram naharaim, Vayavdu b'nei Yisrael et kushan rishataim shmone shanim. So God was, became very angry at Israel and he gave them over. So the, the root mem kaf reish mean, in modern Hebrew means to sell. So it could be that God sold them to the hand of Kushan Rishataim, who was the king of Aram Naharaim, and, and he put the people of Israel in servitude, that is God put the people of Israel in servitude to Kushan Rishataim for eight years. Nine, Vayiz Aku b'nei Yisrael el Adonai, Vayakem Adonai Moshiach, Livne Yisrael, Vayoshiem, et Otniel ben Kenaz, Achi Kalev Hakaton Mimanu. So the people of Israel cried out to God. So God caused a savior to rise up for the people of Israel to save them. Uh, who is this person? Otniel, the son of Kenaz who is the younger brother of Caleb. Okay. Ten. Vatehi alav ruach Adonai, vayishpot et Yisrael, vayetse la milchama, vayitain Adonai biyado et kushan rishataim melech aram, vataaz yado al kushan rishantaim. So the spirit of God settled on him and he judged Israel and they went out to war and God gave in his hand Kushan Rishataim, the, Mela, the king of Aram, and his hand prevailed on Kushan Rishataim. 11. Vatishkot Haaretz Arbaim Shana Vayamat Atniel ben Kenaz. And the land was quiet for 40 years, and Otniel, the son of Kenaz, died. Okay, so Otniel judged for 40 years, the land was quiet, and the king Kushan Rishatayim was given over into his hands. Okay, so let's lead, read the commentary on these verses. 177. Uh, forgot the Lord. A very common phrase found in many books of the Bible to denote the faithlessness and ingratitude of the Israelites when they abandon his worship for that of false gods. Baalim, see on chapter 2. Asherot, singular Asherah, a different word from Ashtarot in chapter 213. It looks similar in English because both begin with an A. And the only difference was the, uh, the T-A-R of Ashtarot. But in Hebrew, Asherah is with an Aleph and Ashtarot is with an Ayin. So it is a completely different word. Uh, so these were trees, so um, Asherot. These were trees planted at the entrance of the pagan temples perhaps as a sort of sign directing the worshipers to the shrine. So it's the tree that is an Asherah, which could be a sign in front of the temple or could be also worshiped itself. 
Undoubtedly, these trees themselves became objects of worship, as is indicated in numerous places in the Bible and Talmud, including our verse. <clears throat> Eight, gave them over, see on chapter two. Kushan Rishatayim. The name is curious, and if Semitic, would mean Kushan of double wickedness. As the dual form is unknown with Hebrew abstract nouns, it is assumed that we have here a proper name. According to Kimchi, Rish Atayim is a place name. Or a Hebraized version of a foreign name like Kasha Rishati, found in Mesopotamian inscriptions of that period. Okay, interesting. If we want to make Kushan Rishatayim into a historical figure, we have a possible connection to a, a Kasha Rishati. Or a descriptive term, something like the double dyed monster. Okay. Aram Naharaim, Aram of the two rivers, denoting the land between the Tigris and the Euphrates, known as Mesopotamia. At that time, a large portion of Mesopotamia was in the hands of the Kashites, a nation originating, originating from the Zagros Mountains. Kushan was one of the Kashite kings and emulating many of his Mesopotamian predecessors, he set out on an expedition of conquest in Syria and Palestine. We have to remember, picture in your mind's eye, the Fertile Crescent that goes from the Ark begins where Iraq and Iran meet at the Persian Gulf. And that's where the Tigris and the Euphrates come together. So from there, go northwest up the between the two rivers, up into the Syrian mountains, and then down, the ark goes down into the land of Israel. Okay, so people moved, nomadic tribes, tribes moved along that fertile crescent or that fertile ark. Okay, so that's what this is talking about. Perhaps Kushan Rishatayim ruled at the top of the ark and wanted to extend his conquest down, <clears throat> as we picture it, the western side of the ark into the land of Israel. Okay, served by paying tribute. Nine, cried, out to, cried unto the Lord in their distress. This recurring phrase suggests the remorse of the people, their sufferings having created a sense of guilt. Otniel, see chapter 113. Since Otniel was Caleb's brother, it's not likely that he was very much younger. It is therefore likely that he was born before the Exodus. In order to avoid dying in the wilderness because of the decree of the spies, he could not be older than 95 at this point. To assume that he was born after the Exodus would make him more than 40 years younger than Caleb. Right. So this is just scholars trying to figure out if he's the younger brother of Caleb, how much younger is he? And was he born before the Exodus or after the Exodus? So if he's 40 years younger, wow, that's a different kind of, of brother than just a couple of years younger. Okay. The spirit, the Targum, the Aramaic translation has the spirit of prophecy. It signifies a sudden and powerful emanation from God, which took possession of the individual and endowed him with gifts transcending the ordinary limits of human power. It manifests itself in the valor of the judge, the wisdom of the ruler, the genius of an artist, like Exodus 21 and 26 about Bitzalel, the because um, God's spirit rested on him in order to give him the artistic creativity to design and execute the, all the vestments and material for the Mishkan. Okay, so it's the spirit of God doesn't rest on a judge just for military purposes. We have examples of it resting on 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 people for artistic reasons too. Uh, or it could be the outpourings of a poet from two Samuel, or the ecstasy of a prophet from one Samuel. Kimchi indeed suggests that it refers to extra strength and valor with which he was endowed to wage war against the oppressors. Mitsudat David, another medieval commentator, adds that he was endowed with wisdom to judge justly. 
Rashi quotes Midrash Tanchuma, that it was a divinely endowed insight into understanding his mission to save Israel despite their shortcomings. Came literally was judged. First, he elevated them spiritually, and then he was able to be victorious. Delivered, Josephus relates that the victory was achieved by a band of resolute men under Otniel's command who surprised the king's bodyguard. Now, Josephus wrote a Jewish history, but scholars of ancient Jewish history, so therefore they would know of Josephus's writings, um, are critical of Josephus's so-called history because what's he basing it on? What, what are the sources that, that uh, Josh, Josephus is using to create his history? Like this here, it, it doesn't say in the book of Judges how Otniel did this. Um, but Josephus is adding, perhaps creating historical fiction about how it, it happened. Prevailed, that is, he enjoyed many victories over the foe. The same verb is used in chapter six. Eleven had rest. That is, the, the, the earth, the, the land was quiet. Uh, so that is from war. Uh, Forty years, according to the traditional chronology, this includes the eight years of oppression by Kushan. Thus we explain, uh, thus we explain, and, <coughs> and the land rested, making a total of 40 years since Kushan commenced to oppress Israel. <clears throat> you have to make the history work. So there's a rabbinic history based on our chronology based on the years given in the Bible itself. So how to make this all work? Because <clears throat> we're told in Kings, uh, we're told when the when the temple was built that it was 430 years since they left Egypt. So the rabbis had to have to work backwards to make it work. So to make it work, it's not 40 years after the eight years. It's eight years plus 32, making 40 years. Okay? So um, it's 1017. Let's stop here for today, and we'll continue with verse 12 <coughs> uh, next time. <coughs> Wishing everybody a good rest of the day and uh, Shabbat Shalom, everybody. Take care. Shabbat Shalom.